lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike Podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing okay. This has been, like... The most relaxing day I've had so far of my week off, even though I had, went, had to go into the office. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so vacation going good? Mm, sure. <laughs> You've been with me for half of it. I have been with you for a lot of it. <laughs> Has it been much of a vacation, I'd like to say? No, a lot, no. A lot of work getting done. <laughs> yeah, but at least it's getting done. It is getting done, so that's something. Uh, yeah. Um, we, we discovered some new smells. Yeah, ooh, don't recommend them either. <laughs> <laughs> Not the worst I've smelled, actually. Yeah. Um, well, I said the same thing that that I actually kind of expected a little worse. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I the thing. So I'm about to. Uh, incriminate someone, I suppose, in some way. It's probably not incrimination. I don't know how this works. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, the the fridge, um, that got left without power for a year. Yeah. Uh. We threw that away, and um, at the dump, they said, uh, "Does it have any food in it?" <laughs> the person answering said, "No." And I said, "Actually, yeah. that was not a lie, because <laughs> yeah, what is in there is not food anymore." Yeah, you cannot <laughs> classify that as food in any way. <laughs> it's not food anymore. I mean, anymore. I didn't open it to look, <laughs> but I'm thinking that's not food. Yeah. Well, when it popped open, it didn't smell. <laughs> it like didn't smell like food. Yeah. <laughs> No. Oh, good Ooh. times. Yeah, that was that was interesting. Trying to move that thing without opening the doors was interesting too. Yeah, um, waited too long to think about sealing them. Yeah. Well, we were, we didn't know how bad it was going to be to move. So <laughs> no, no. But I, you know, I thought that. Well, I, had we already taught, tried to tie them at that point? I can't yeah. remember. We had tried um, to tie them, but the rope didn't hold. Yeah, I, and I didn't expect it to, and I. Um, so I, I ended up cutting. The bottom piece of a uh, the bottom wire piece of a um, coat hanger. Yeah, and wrapping that and twisting, twisting as yeah. much as I can. And that pretty well seemed to hold it. But yeah, wish we'd even, done that first. Yeah, though. yeah, we wish we had done that from the outset. <laughs> I don't know if it would have managed to keep a seal that way still, but uh, anyway. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um. So, as promised. Uh, we have oh to yeah start we off. had we had breaking news as we finished the podcast last week yes in the in slapgate <laughs> in slapgate right <laughs> um so will smith resigns from the academy yep. yep that was breaking as we finished the podcast last week yeah so yeah that's there's <laughs> our update on the <laughs> will your... smith fiasco on yeah. slapgate yeah yeah uh, not not a whole lot else really developing there as of right now. Chris Rock is keeping his mouth shut. He said that he said eventually he will talk about it and it will be funny. Yeah, that's that was the last thing I heard from him. Oh yeah, um, there are scattered reports that uh, Will Smith is a cuck. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. unconfirmed. I'd, I'd say they're more than just scattered. <laughs> <laughs> unconfirmed. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that about that's, covers it. That's pretty well. That's pretty well. Slapgate as of this week. We'll keep yeah. our ear to the ground, like I say. As as yeah. more develops, we will continue in coverage. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we're done. <laughs> that's it for the week. <laughs> <laughs> if only. Uh, so, um, I, I think actually the thing to talk about is the whole uh, "Don't say gay" bill. Oh uh, yeah. Fiasco. Yeah. Um. And maybe like some of the Disney stuff related to that and so on. It's, yes. this is, this whole thing is insane. Like everybody, like step back for a moment, everyone. Yeah. And just like, look at what's really going on and realize that this is insane. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Um, well, the bill, all it does is it prevents teaching <laughs> um, sex education and, and uh, alternative lifestyles to children Lower than third grade, so like yeah. under eight. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> eight. Yeah. So your your four, five, six, and seven year olds can no longer find out about alternative sexual orientations. Yeah, at least from school. Yeah, as as an instruction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah, that's what this is about. And, and um, like we didn't have sex ed till I was 
in high school. I was going to say, so yeah, we had it when I was in high school and, and that was controversial then. Yeah. Like, and that, that's kind of what I wanted to kind of say about it is like, I just want people to think about how far we've come here. We're in high school when we were coming up, sex ed was controversial. And now we're literally talking about, can we talk about sex with like little six year olds? Yeah. Little kids. <laughs> Like, I mean, that's, that's how far the pendulum has swung. Yeah. Um, and don't you think as a parent that probably, um, sexual education should go on at home? I do. Um, and the, the, as far as with high school, I'm a little more, Yeah. I mean, I can, I can get by with that. Like, I don't have a problem with that, but as far as like, we're talking about. Yeah. If you haven't gotten to it by then with your kids, it's probably yeah, time. It's, it's probably <laughs> time somebody had that talk with yeah. them. Um, and, and my bad, my phone's ringing, but it's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm good with high school, but when we're talking about elementary school kids, no, that mm -hmm. it doesn't belong there. The first half of elementary. Yeah. School. <laughs> yeah. The early half of elementary. Yeah. yeah. It, it just doesn't belong there in any way. And like, when I think back to when I was at that age, like I didn't know if my teachers were married or if they mm -hmm. had a boyfriend. Like, well, yeah, see, that's the weirdest thing. Like uh, most of the complaints that I've heard from teachers about this is they're like, now I can't tell my students about what I did this weekend or, you know, these kind of things. And, um, yeah, there was a, a, a an obviously gay uh, kindergarten, I want to say, or maybe he might have been first grade teacher that's like, oh, well, now I feel like I can get in trouble for, you know, telling um, my kids when they ask about my weekend, you know, that I went rafting with my partner. Yeah. And my first thought was, well, no, you just answered it. Yeah, all right. Like, that's what you say. Yeah. I went rafting with my partner. You can leave out the orgy afterwards. Like, you don't have to talk about that with your first graders. You exactly. Just, like, tell them that you went rafting with your partner. Yeah. Um, and But then my next thought was, I can't remember ever asking any teacher what they did over the weekend. Right. <laughs> ever. No, I definitely can't remember asking, but I remember teachers coming in and talking mm -hmm. about what they had done over. And it was usually some, like thing they had planned on just talking about with the mm -hmm. class, you know, Oh, so this weekend we did blah, 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 you know, yeah. Get, like a part of knowing who your teacher is, which mm -hmm. is, is all fine, mm -hmm. but we don't need all of the extra stuff that they're trying to put along with that. Yeah. Because it's important for students, especially at that age to like, feel like they know their teacher, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, the teacher coming in and talking about their mm -hmm. weekend is all fine. Mm -hmm. We don't need the other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, so, um, I, and I asked my brother about this, like, uh, how much did you know in school about your teachers? Well, the first question I asked was how much did you know about your teacher's sex lives? Yeah. And the answer was absolutely nothing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, but then I was like, well, how much did you know about your teacher's personal lives at all? He's like yeah. very, very little. Yeah. And, and my brother and I, I feel like are kind of special cases because our mom is a teacher. Yeah, so like, you, a she lot was of those, friends with these people. Yeah, like you knew them from outside of school a lot of times. Yeah, yeah. and still didn't know anything about their personal lives. Yeah, really. and I will. I say, couldn't have told you who was married and who wasn't. Most of, and for at, at least three quarters of my teachers, I couldn't have told you whether they were even married or not. Yeah, well, and especially when you're talking about the elementary school age. Oh yeah. Um, and even like high school teachers, when like I, I wasn't looking at the hot science teacher in high school and trying to figure out if she had a if ring that was a ring or not. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> um, but even the high school teachers, the good ones kept all of that stuff aside politics as well. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I know my government teacher, like I never knew she, and she was by far one of the best teachers I had. Mm -hmm. Um, like I didn't know where her pol political affiliations were. Yeah. Like I mean that that wasn't something that and she was teaching government. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, and and there's ways of bringing in some activism uh, through like your personal life and so forth. You know, I'm I'm sure that my mom talked about the you know um, cleaning up the beach weekends and yeah. those kind of things. Like there's there's ways of introducing activism without yeah. like shoving it in their face. Absolutely. And, and that's kind of what this is all about really anyway, isn't it? I mean, yeah. um, that there's, okay. And I think I've talked about this on the podcast before, but, uh, the game magic, the gathering has a story that goes along with it. In fact, the, the creative part has gotten to be a bigger part of the game. I don't really play anymore cause my shop closed, but, um, 
anyway, like I used to keep up with the story, uh, yeah. especially in the later years, because it, they were getting like real serious writers yeah. writing this stuff. So it, it was, was interesting. It was pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, and uh, so there were like five or six main characters. And then somewhere along the way, um, they felt like they weren't being diverse enough. Yeah. Uh, even though they had, um, you know, queer characters of some kind in, uh, you know, as side characters from throughout. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, but so then they made two of those five or six main characters, uh, a lesbian couple. And then one of them was pansexual and you're like, okay, all right, this, this game is for 13 and up. Yeah. Right. Uh, so at least they're teenagers <laughs> in this yeah. case, but, yeah. um, and, and they're, you know, I'm not sure what the goal was. It was just the diversity and inclusion yeah. crap. I mean, the, the, yeah. they're based in Want to be able to Washington check that box. State, so, yeah. yeah. Um, but I thought, well, there's first off, there's a difference between tolerance and acceptance. Yeah. Um, like, you can still say something is, or, or normalizing. I guess yeah. that's... That's, that's really, really what we're getting at, yeah. You know? So... Um, I thought like if you want to introduce uh, alternative lifestyles and characters, like use side characters and have everybody be nice to him and make it like not a thing. Yeah, yeah. But instead, what they did was they threw it into main characters. So now like half of your main characters are some kind of alternative lifestyle. Yeah. Um, and they're shoving it in your face. And yeah. there's a very big difference between those two things. Like it could have been a sideline issue that nobody paid any attention to. It's like race over the last few years. Yeah. Right. So race had become a thing that was kind of a non-issue yeah. for a while. Yeah. And then it became the issue again. Yeah. And in the name of trying to make everybody tolerant or make it all equal or what whatever, but what it ends up doing is it ends up creating resentment because you're like, I can't get away from this thing that's that to me should be a non-issue. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Something that's that's just doesn't come into consideration. You yeah. Know? Um, and when you and I were talking about this the other day, we started talking about like the okay, so the lady who. Um, said that you know she introduces herself to her students. She's she's got a little bio now. She can't give her bio because she's married to a trans woman, which I think is a biological male that's now female. I, yeah. Some of the nomenclature still escapes me on this, but um, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Uh, so she's married to a trans woman, and now um, what does she do about her bio? I was like, well, why don't you just say you're married? Yeah. Well, and why does <laughs> why does this have to be? And that's that was what I was getting at the other day is right. like why does why does this have to be who you are? Like, mm -hmm. are you you're not more than just this lesbian or gay guy or anything like that? Like, yeah. like that's that's not who you are. Like, I mean, that's part of who you are, but that shouldn't be all you are. Yeah, I find it weird that it's the defining feature. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. That, mm. Like that, that's you're you're. I just can't imagine that. Like that I'm defining. just nothing if I'm not gay. Yeah, I, I don't. Understand. I don't understand that. Like I just, I, I, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, I heard some. I wish I could remember where I, I'd heard this. Some commentator along the way saying, um, "Well, you know, we've gotten to this place where we glorify individualism to such a great degree. Now, I glorify individualism too, but um, the that, individual is the most important. Yeah, sovereignty. Yeah, <laughs> um, the you know that we glorify individualism to such a great degree that people that are just kind of boring yeah. latch on to whatever and make it the thing. They, yeah. you know." Um, and in this case, I guess it's their, you know, this sexuality yeah. is the thing that they latch onto. Now, um, I hate to overgeneralize here too, but, uh, I have, um, I've had relationships with a couple of girls that seem to define themselves around their sexuality. Yeah. And in both cases, they had abuse in their background. Yeah. Well. <laughs> and so like that, and, and that's something actually I should probably mention as well. Um, now if like trying to introduce sexuality to a seven year old doesn't make sense to me, No. but if you see a seven year old, that sexuality is something that seems to be important to them. You should probably start asking some questions. Yeah. Where is this coming from? Yeah. Because there's only so many places it could be coming from. Right. So like, I understand in unless terms they're of, teaching it in the school. Well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, but uh, 
like I, I want to give these people the benefit of the doubt that they that the reason that they're concerned about this, at least some of them, the reason they're concerned about this is if there's some trouble going on at home yeah. related to this, to something, something related to sexuality yeah. that they feel like they can't intervene or, um, you know, seek help or talk yeah. about the, talk about it with the student or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that that's the case. No. The and, bill. and I, I mean, I haven't looked close enough to know one way or the other, but even if what I would say in that situation is there needs to be a group of people that oh, begin yeah. to intervene at that point. Like it shouldn't just be the teacher and then that's it. Right. You like, go to the principal and every single school has social workers. I was now fixing and, to say like, the counselors and I mean, yeah. there are people on staff at the school that are qualified to, to look into this, Yeah, you know, and maybe there's nothing there. Maybe there is, but mm -hmm. we know for a fact that this stuff happens. Yeah. So, you know, it, yeah. being prepared to deal with it is important. Yeah, uh, beyond that, I don't, I don't understand what the big deal is. Yeah, it's it's definitely, and it it's really well. The big deal is is that we can't that there's a group of people out there that want to propagandize children, mm -hmm. and and this is standing in the way of that. Yeah, well, I I think that there's a group. It's beyond propagandizing children. I think that there's uh I think that there's a group of people that want to tear apart families. Yeah. That that don't want the family to be a, a loyalty unit. Yeah. Yeah. Um and uh you know, alternative lifestyles are a way of degrading the family unit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. And yeah, I've Michael at thelibertymike.com. Go <laughs> yeah. ahead, send me your comments. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I the the um the family unit has been a structural unit of society for millennia. Yeah. I mean as and, long as we've been around, right? <laughs> yeah, essentially. And there's yeah. and there's some, you know, there's some variations of it, but it it yeah. more or less functions in the same way in every society. That's yeah. not it's not a complete cultural universal, but it's pretty close. Yeah. Um, and there are advantages to it, and that's that's yeah. why. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, you know, I, I understand like wanting to explore um alternatives, like this is how we move forward. Yeah. But there's a point where promoting alternatives just for the sake of them being different is harmful. Yeah. Yeah. And we're definitely like in that realm here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, to, I, I look at it and I'm like, God, the world's gone crazy around that. And then there's yeah. the Disney stuff. Um, so then Disney who apparently, uh, had nothing to say, um, in terms of lobbying about the bill before it was passed. Yeah. Uh, now has a very public outcry about this. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a leaked uh, Zoom call, Disney Zoom call, with a bunch of people saying um, all kinds of strange things. And, you know, one of the things is that, you know, that they've been trying to be more inclusive, and so they're um, they're changing their language, and they're, they're removing gendered language from all their little announcements and everything. So now instead of ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's... Uh, um, everyone or friends. And then, uh, for some event that they do regularly, instead of ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's going to be dreamers of all ages. Yeah. And I like that. I yeah. do. I like the dreamers of all ages yeah. thing. I think that that fits their brand and it's a nice way to address people, uh, you know, yeah. especially children. children. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but the, the, like the reason for it, it is yeah. so strange to me. Yeah. And then, it, and it's like you're bending over backwards to try and satisfy a very, very small percentage of the population. Yeah. Very small percentage of the population. I mean, estimates are, are like that somewhere between 2 and 3% of the population is gay. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, and it's probably closer to 2. And it may be even less than that. Yeah. And, but like you start asking people what percentage of the population they think is gay and they'll give you numbers like 10%. <laughs> you know, like the population of San Francisco is at 10% gay. Right. <laughs> um, and it, it's just, uh, 
people severely overestimate the number of people that are involved. And, but it's just a very vocal, and actually the the vocal portion of it isn't even the the you know the the community. Yeah. Um, it's mostly a whole bunch of like young liberal women. Yeah, that are the vocal part that aren't even gay, <laughs> right? Um, but but they're allies. <laughs> yeah, but they they have to have this outcry for something, I guess, and yeah. this is what they've chosen. Yeah. Um, and uh, but one of the one of the people on the call was saying um, that she, uh, you know, as the parent of uh, of a queer child, in fact, two queer children, one of my children is trans and the other one is pansexual. By the way, I <laughs> pansexual, I guess, is the new bisexual. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. Pansexual to me means, uh, like, willing to have sex with anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I... I'm guessing that what they actually mean is that instead of um, gay or straight, it includes all the non-conforming yeah. groups as well. So I, I'm not sure, though. I, I have no idea. Yeah, I, um, I don't know. Yeah, so. <laughs> this acronym has gotten insane anyway. The LGBTQQIAAP. I, I don't. I can't keep plus. up anymore. You got to put the plus on there. Uh, yeah. Well, because there's more, right? <laughs> all right. Um, but. Like she was saying, this is a very proud parent, and I was thinking, you messed up. Right? <laughs> Where did you go wrong along the way? <laughs> yeah. Like, what have you been teaching your children that that yeah. that? I just assumed both, but it may not. I mean, she may have more children than that. Yeah. But still, yeah. that two of your children are uh, are you know some kind of um, alternative sexual orientation. Yeah. Like, and but part of it too was that. And I don't know this. Yeah. Um, I mean, it could be that her, the kids she's talking about are in their late teens or something. Yeah. Um, but when she was saying it, I was thinking like her kids are probably like six and 10. Yeah. And that's odds are that's probably the case, Yeah. <laughs> which is scary. Like, yeah. These kids shouldn't even be thinking about that. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, like, you know, at what age, like maybe 10, you're starting to yeah. to think about sex, particularly if you're a girl. Girls start maturing earlier than guys do, but, yeah. um, and finish maturing later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, when you're in elementary school, like through, especially for the portion covered by this bill, yeah. you should be asexual. Yeah, exactly. Like this, this should be a, a complete non-issue for you. Yeah. Like, Something this, that you do not understand and do not think about. Yeah. I mean, certainly I was in, yeah. at that age. I mean, I'm the same way. So I don't, I don't understand the push to, yeah. to push this stuff on to children. Like it just, it, it doesn't make logical sense to me. No. And especially when you're talking about a government school doing it. Yeah. Um, because that's, that's really where the rubber meets the road here because this is, what you have to keep in the consideration is this isn't just your kids. This is everybody's kids. Mm -hmm. So you don't, and it, it, for a system that you're forced to pay into, because this isn't like a voluntary system where it's like some private school where we want to do this or that. Like this is our, this is the public school. Yeah. Well, at least, at least it's like right out in front now. Cause, um, I do remember as things were starting to shift, um, and especially when I was looking into, uh, when I was running for board of education, I was looking into some of this curriculum stuff and, and so forth. And everything's been so standardized. Yeah. Um, and I, I will relate it back to the medical field again. Like there's an advantage to allowing doctors to doctor, yeah, to, to be themselves and choose their, their own paths of treatment. Um, and the same is true for teachers. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't want them all locked into the same thing, but there has been more and more centralization, central control of curriculums and so forth over time. Yeah. Um, and I think this is a bad thing. It's hard to develop best practices that way if you don't have any innovation. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think that you should allow teachers to teach the way that they think is appropriate, but it, that's beside the point. Um, when I was looking at this curriculum stuff, like some of the things, uh, that had, that had been standardized in a lot of ways, um, you were seeing the introduction of these alternative lifestyles in kind of an insidious way. I thought yeah. where it would be like a word problem in math 
where it would be um, Catherine and her wife Heather went to the you know that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, why would you insert that there? Like, yeah. it just doesn't it doesn't jive. Like, yeah. it, it, it there's no reason for that to be there. Oh, there is. <laughs> well, there is, but the, yeah, it's not a good reason. <laughs> yeah. Um, but th- this is not how you. This is not how you teach tolerance, or I, I don't think. Uh, I'm, you know, maybe I'm wrong. And I'm not running for school board again, so. Well, I mean, that's, the, so that type of word problem makes me wonder, like, how many kids raise their hand after that and be like, what do you mean, her wife? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, we're you're talking about, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> they're doing mad, and all of a sudden you're getting questions like that. I yeah. mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe that was the purpose too. That may be the purpose. Yeah, just to spur that conversation. They yeah. sure as hell aren't teaching your kids math. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, like I, you know, Not like I, I learned it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I remember helping um, your oldest daughter with math stuff years ago yeah. and going this this is not how you do this <laughs> yeah. problem this isn't this is the totally i don't know how you could ever get to the right answer following these instructions like let me show yeah. you how to do it right yeah if you want <laughs> to actually find the answer like this yeah. is what you would do like um, this is the simplest way to get the correct answer yeah and what what's the curriculum called the bill gates's curriculum that's out there C- common core Common core, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I remember listening to a testimony from the guy who developed the math portion of the Common Core saying that it wasn't meant to uh, to create proficiency in math. Yeah. Well, what's the point then? then? Why? Like, why yeah. are we sending our kids to you to teach them math if the curriculum that you have for math isn't supposed to make them proficient in math? <laughs> right. It's the whole point of teaching them math in the first place is to right. make them proficient. Anyway, yeah. um, so the bottom line for all of this is uh, homeschool or private school your children. Yeah. Government schools are no good, man. <laughs> yeah. Let's privatize the whole thing. Um, and it costs you more money than it should anyway. Yeah. Um, so. Us. Yeah, yeah. I don't even have kids in school, and I still have to pay for it. Exactly. Um, so, uh, do you have anything else on that? No, I really don't. Um, just, I, I just want people to just, t- like you had said from the beginning, kind of take a step back and look at where we're at with this yeah. and how far this has came. Well, and um, the the um, the left has done a good job marketing this one. Like oh the yeah. Don't say gay thing that like that was that's genius. Like it totally. Yeah. Which, um, by the way, is not in that bill anywhere. Yeah. It's it's all <laughs> just marketing. Like it's yeah. that, but they, I mean, they really have like hit this one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and a big part of it, I think, is probably to demonize DeSantis because they see him as a threat in twenty twenty four. Honestly, um, you may not have never even heard about this if DeSantis wasn't a ca- potential candidate. Yeah. yeah. Um, it may have never even hit mainstream. Yeah. Um, I think it would have anyway. It's possible, but but yeah. that's definitely a part of it, though. Yeah. Him gonna probably run for president. Um. Okay. Well, we got a uh, we got twenty minutes or so. What else you want to talk about? Ah, uh, I don't know. You don't have anything else on the agenda? I I mean, I have some notes uh, on war. Um, yeah. that people are probably tired of. <laughs> I I uh, yeah. Slapgate generated a lot more interest than. <laughs> than than no the more. war, <laughs> um, the genocide occurring in Ukraine. I do. So uh, my mom had some people o- over uh, yesterday for a little while, uh, two of them veterans, and um, they both said that that the U.S. needs to get involved militarily and go in there and nip this in the bud and go ahead and take care yeah, of things. Because so cause we're so good at that, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, of course, they wouldn't have to fight now. Like, they're yeah. past that. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody else would have to go bleed out there for, for yeah. this. Um, and I, I missed it. I wasn't there for that, which might be a good thing. I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's not like we shy away from political discussions at my mom's house. But, yeah. Um, I was like, they're nuts. Yeah. That, yeah. That's insane. That's an insane thing to, to say. Um, and I, I was listening. I did finally get to listen to the uh, uh, Colonel McGregor's uh, interview with Scott Horton. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, Scott was saying the same thing that, I, that I've said for a long time, which is I, I, don't, I don't see how you have a conventional war with a power like Russia. No. That it will, like, if you get involved, if you start trading blows with Russia, it will eventually escalate into nuclear war. Yeah. Um, I, I don't see a way around that. Yeah. And Scott mentioned that to uh, to Colonel McGregor, and he, he said, well, do you agree? And uh, Colonel McGregor says, uh, no. Yeah. Um, 
I I didn't agree with that. Yeah. He said, however, <laughs> yeah. um, we're now in a place where I do agree with oh, that. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, and he said it's because of changes and announcements that Biden has made. He really? said this is Biden's fault um, yeah. that he uh, refuses to. Uh, uh, to agree to a no first use policy that he's created a whole bunch of other um, scenarios in which he says the U.S. would be willing to use nuclear weapons, uh, you know, including uses uh, by somebody else of chemical or biological weapons. Um, he said, you know, he's created a scenario where um, the Russians have to think all the time that that we the, may go. Yeah, that we may press the button. Yeah. Yeah. And that that has made this far more uh, a far more tenuous situation. Yeah. Which I thought was interesting. Um, I still think it, that was true before Biden. But yeah, um, I, I did like he is right about the, the announcements that Biden has made about um, about nuclear weapons. And, and I've always criticized the U.S. for not adopting a no first use policy like almost every other country in the world has done. Yeah. Including, I think, Russia. Well, the problem uh, is, is we've used first before. <laughs> yeah, but but, but we not, were the first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and then we saw what happened, and we should have after that said we yeah, should have been the first to adopt a no a, no a first, no use, first policy. use policy. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I agree with that yeah. absolutely. Um, and and I still maintain that we don't need nuclear weapons to destroy any country in the world, even if they have nuclear weapons. No, well, and, like our and, conventional forces are enough. And Putin's proven that right now. I mean, he's just destroying Ukraine. <laughs> At least from what I've seen on TV, like yeah, well, yeah. Um, so what do you know about Buka? Not much. No. Okay. Um, well, that's the one that all, all week has been the atrocities in Buka that they were executing yeah. hundreds of civilians, uh, hands tied behind their back and shot in the head in the street. I haven't heard um, all that, but I have heard the name really? tossed around. So, okay. I mean, I've heard the, the, the name tossed around. Well, it, <laughs> it came up talking with my mom either last night or night before last. And uh, when she said it, I was like, well, and she was like, don't even don't even start telling me that you don't that you believe it was staged or something. Yeah. Okay. So I just left it there. Yeah. I don't believe it was staged. Yeah. I'm not entirely convinced it was the Russians. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, there's been this. yeah, there's been some of that go, and, and that always happens in these type of mm -hmm. conflicts. Well, to me, it's like you remember when we were talking about the Assad gas attacks, exactly. And we said, well, but it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Like he's already won this war. Why do something that would draw in the West? Yeah. Um, it, it's the same case here. I mean, yeah. Russia, for well, all intents and purposes, has won this war. This is really just mop up. The difference, the but here's the problem with the scenario you're laying out mm -hmm. is in the media they're not portraying it that way well, that that yeah. this war has been won and this is all just kind of the the end of it or whatever mm -hmm. um the media is portraying it as putin's lost and he's desperate um, oh, yeah. and that's but that's but that works into the propaganda of when he uses those weapons the american people aren't going to look at that as oh well they'll see it as an act of desperation mm -hmm. not as well, could this have been staged or done by the other side well, or something like that? but this isn't even using those weapons. This is just executing civilians on your way out of town. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that that's uh, that's what the claim is. Is it? Is that, yeah. that on March 30th, I guess, or whatever, when um, Russia left Bukha, yeah. uh, when the Russian forces abandoned Bukha, that they were killing civilians on the way out. Or yeah. that they'd been killing civilians in the streets yeah, and just uh, left them there and left these mass graves. But there, there are problems yeah. with this also. Um, first is, I, to my understanding, it has already been shown that the mass grave is actually full of Ukrainian militia and Russian soldiers that right. died there. So yeah. like combatants, it's both sides. Yeah. yeah, and it's combatants. Yeah. Um, yeah, because this was like a front line area. Yeah, uh, for so they had a, a full, of this war. full battle there. Yeah, yeah, there were there were street fighting going on in Buka. I, yeah. I believe. Yeah, um, it's hard to you know you don't it's hard really to know. know yeah, this, but um, but yeah, the you know there's uh, of course there's like blown up um, tanks and so forth and and crew carriers and so on in the in the city and <clears throat> anyway. Um, but beyond that, uh, a couple of people, um, Joe Loria, who is a, uh, 
a, um, a journalist that I respect at Consortium News. And then, of course, uh, you know, one of my go-tos on this kind of stuff, which is uh, Bernard at moonofalabama.org, yeah. um, are both delivering the same kind of timeline about what happened here. Yeah. Um, and so just so that that you get like a fuller picture, because this became International News Sunday, I guess. Yeah. Maybe Saturday night, s- somewhere in there. Yeah. I heard it Sunday. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I did not hear it the day before, but I only watched the news in the morning, so, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, the Russians, it, it is, so the Russians announced that they were out on March 30th. Okay. Yeah. Um, that was confirmed by the the mayor of Buka, uh, Fedoruk, or something like that. Yeah. Um, on March thirty first, and he was saying, you know, uh, this will go down in the glorious history of Buka, the Liberation Day, you know, or something. Yeah. Um, on his announcement, made no mention of any atrocities. Yeah. Now it's possible he's, you know. Like he wasn't aware at the time, but the the video and the pictures are showing people just like dead in the streets. Yeah, like it seems like it would have been hard. I did see some video notice. of literally like people bodies just laying in the street. Yeah, like I did see some of that. Um, and again, you know, just based on the pictures, uh, it does seem like it had happened very recently. Like they hadn't been there for a long because there was uh, it was raining yeah. and there was still like puddles of blood around these people. Yeah. yeah. So uh, well, it's got to be fairly recent. Yeah, yeah. It's got to be fairly recent now that, but that was April 2nd. Yeah. That all these videos and pictures came started out. coming out. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, on the 31st, when he announced the, the liberation of Buka and the, that the Russian forces had left, he mm. didn't make any mention of any of this. Okay. Um, the New York times was there, uh, on April 2nd. Yeah. Um, that Saturday. Um, and you know, I, it was like a little short article with some pictures, um, and, uh, they didn't mention it either. Yeah. And, but one thing that they did mention, um, was that the Azov battalion forces were moving through the city. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then, um, uh, according to Joe Loria, cause I don't speak Ukrainian, no. um, I don't know that he does either, actually. But what, anyway, his reporting yeah. uh, said that the um, U.S. and EU-funded site, uh, Ukrainian language site, Left Left Bank, um, announced on the second. Also, uh, quote: "The city is being cleared from saboteurs and accomplices accomplices of Russian forces." End quote. Yeah. Not of Russian forces, but saboteurs and accomplices of Russian forces. Yeah. Now. What I think of when I hear a statement like that is that they're they're rousting people that were too close to the Russians, Russian sympathizers in the city. Yeah, citizens in the city that were Russian sympathizers. Yeah. Um, and it was hours later that the atrocities were announced and the photos and the videos appeared. Yeah. So I just want to present this alternative that yeah. what might have happened <laughs> was that the Russians left. The Azov battalion moved in, started talking to people, figured out who had been sympathetic to the Russians while they were in the city. Yeah. Who gave and them? And they executed them and yeah. then blamed it on the Russians. Yeah. And, and that, you know, I'm and, not saying that's what happened, but it makes sense. Yeah. And the um, the Pentagon has even said, you know, the Pentagon, which includes all those intelligence agencies, yeah. um, has said that they cannot confirm... Uh, that the Russians were responsible for this. Yeah. Um, they also won't deny it either. Yeah. But we but it, we but had to makes... have had satellite imagery that would show. Yeah. When those bodies appeared. Yeah. And but there's no mention of them for two days, three days after the Russians left. Well, and it makes sense for the for the Azov battalion to come through and, and make an example of anybody who who cooperated when the Russians showed up. Right. Because you don't want that to happen in the next town they go into or city or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, You want people to think twice before cooperating with the Russians. Right. Which these people are literally, I want everybody to remember, like these poor citizens are being held hostage. Like yeah. there, there are from both sides. From that's what I'm saying. From yeah. both sides, like literally, you've got people here that have no good option. Mm-hmm. Like the Russians come in and you cooperate with them, but then the Russians leave and the Azov battalion comes in and 
then they execute you for, you know, cooperating with the Russians or vice versa. Like, right. I mean, there's no, you've got people here that have no good option of mm -hmm. what to do, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that, I think this particular incident kind of highlights some of that, that, mm -hmm. you know, these, this is a, this is a really bad situation. Yeah. Which is why, once again, what the U S should be doing here is trying to push for a ceasefire yeah. rather than instigate it further. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And it, it, it just seems to me that, that the U S has never made any attempt to end this war. No. I, and or to prevent it. To to even prevent it from the beginning because mm -hmm. I mean after all of this started we we laid it out very specifically what could have been done to prevent have prevented this. Yeah. And and our our country decided not to do that. Mm -hmm. To take any of those roads. So Yeah, um I was listening to uh, an inter uh, Scott Horton interview with Oh no, now I can't remember his name. Um, here, talk for a second while I look oh. it up. <laughs> well, uh, don't, don't do don't. I, I want to give the guy credit. Yeah. yeah. Dude, I got nothing, man. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. You, you know, talk about gayness. <laughs> no. <laughs> Lyle Goldstein. Sorry about that. Um, I was listening to an interview with Lyle Goldstein, and, and so this is a guy that when I was saying... Um, I didn't think that the Russians would actually invade. Yeah. He was saying that he thought that they would. Really? He was right. Yeah. Um, he wins. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, he, um, let's see. What, what, oh, he was saying that a big part of this was the water to Crimea. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Um, he said that the, he, one of his musings in this interview was like, I wonder if this would have even turned out this way if the Ukrainians had just allowed water into Crimea instead of putting Putin in a position where he felt like he had to go make get, that happen. <laughs> get them water. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but, you know, we had talked a little bit at the very beginning, but I didn't think that it was like a real deciding factor about uh, the Ukrainians cutting off water to the Crimean Peninsula. Yeah. Um, but he thinks that that is one of the yeah. most important factors that led to this invasion. Yeah. Uh, could be, and he nailed it on the invasion. So he might probably he, he may have he, he, he may might have be something. right about the motivations yeah. as well. Yeah, well, he's definitely got standing at the least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. And uh. So, you know, I I find that interesting. The the main thing I I guess that I want people to understand from this is that you you are definitely only getting one side in the U.S. Yeah. Like uh, we have picked. We have picked who the good guy is and who the bad guy is, and I don't think that there are any good guys in no. this. Um, and, and, uh, we are including us, by including, the way. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, because we're just, we're just trying to prolong it. It seems. Yeah. Um, and we feel that, uh, you know, when I say we, I'm, I'm talking about the government or the intelligence community, um, <laughs> is, has this belief that, uh, if they can just, just get Putin bogged down, long enough that it'll destroy Russia. It'll, um, you know, bring down the Putin regime and, and what have you. Uh, yeah. And they've said this, like, openly. I just, they've I, said this. I just don't understand how they think that a uh, uh, brought-down, weak Russia is that good for us. I don't either. I just, I don't, I don't understand how that logic balances. Now, obviously, I get when you're talking in empire mode mm -hmm. that... Yeah, I mean, we want everybody to be as weak as they can so we can be the strongest. Yeah. Um, but it, it doesn't, as far as, like, if you want to create stability, mm -hmm. like, that doesn't create stability in the world, having Russia be weak. No, you know, no. Um, or, or in the region. Or unstable. Like, it just, it doesn't, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't make good sense to me. Yeah, um, I mean, they were essentially saying that... Uh, Obviously, after uh, the terror war, I say yeah. after like it's over, but you know, yeah. um, we have uh, shown that we don't know how to defeat defeat an insurgency. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but we have definitely shown that we know how to create one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, because we've done that everywhere we've went. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you know it has created we we've left nothing but chaos in our wake here um yeah. you know libya 
say what you will about Muammar Gaddafi. He was uh, brutal. He was cold. Um, <clears throat> but he, at least if you stayed in line, yeah. he took care of the people of Libya. Yeah. Um, and he, the, and he kept can't, the country under control. Well, what I was going to say is you can't say that Libya is better off now than it was under Gaddafi. Exactly. Like, and I'm not saying Gaddafi is some saint because we all know he ain't. Mm -hmm. But the people of Libya were better under him than they are now. And by the way, the same goes for Iraq. Yeah. I mean, and, and you know, Saddam Hussein was a butcher. I don't care for the guy. But... Mm -hmm. But the people of Iraq were better off under him than they are now. Yeah. I yeah. mean... Um, and Syria, uh, yeah. same way. Better with uh, Bashar al-Assad just controlling the country yeah. than the creation of the caliphate. That, yeah. That we did. We we instigated the creation of the caliphate. Yeah. Um, the ISIS. Yeah. Right? You, remember, you may oh. remember this term. <laughs> yes. It <laughs> um, came up once or twice. But but ISIS is a, is a creation of the U.S. intelligence services. Yeah. Um, and uh, not intentionally. Yeah. I mean, but it was yeah. the result of our intervention over there. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I, li I like to point this out over and over again because it just shows how uh, ridiculous our foreign policy is. Um, where we were supporting the uh, the Shia uh, the Shia majority in Iraq, overthrowing yeah. the Sunni government, yeah. and then came to realize that um, the that that empowered Iran yeah. in Iraq, and uh, but we couldn't just keep switch sides in the war. <laughs> yeah, literally. So instead, um, we we created an insurgency. Uh, a Sunni ins insurgency in Syria to try and bring down Iran's good friend Bashar al-Assad, yeah. um, which resulted in the in the creation of ISIS yeah. uh, by funding by funding those militia groups um, that broke off from Al Qaeda. Yeah, uh, and <laughs> so at the at the same time though we're like funding and arming these Sunni militias in Syria and fighting them right across the border in Iraq. Yeah. Right. You can't make this stuff up, man. Like it's insane. And, uh, and so Syria still has problems yeah. because of this. I mean, not that it was, you know, not that it was the, a uh, lovely place before, but yeah. like there's still chaos there. There's still areas of Syria where there's intense fighting. Yeah. There's, and, that situation didn't exist before. Yeah. Well, and it was the same way with Iraq. Um, I, I've heard some interviews of people who, who lived through the whole event in, mm -hmm. in Iraq pr prior to us coming and then being there and left the country short uh, ways after we left. Yeah. Like, And they all say the same thing. They mm -hmm. were like, you know, they were so happy initially when the Americans came. But then they realized real quick that once Saddam was gone, the Americans weren't really doing anything there. They weren't. They bought. They blew up and bombed all of the stuff, and they weren't exactly rebuilding it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, they were just destroying the country. Well, the uh, U.S. government was paying somebody to rebuild it, but it it may yeah. not have been getting done. But yeah, well, the like I said, the, the taxpayer was paying the for it. Interviews I heard was that you know things things got bad, mm -hmm. and that people were initially like excited about the Americans coming. Like yeah. they thought that this was going to be a liberation and a good mm -hmm. thing, and and just as the months and years went by, it was like the, it that didn't it got it just got worse and worse and worse. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, and then of course, like the best thing that happened to Afghanistan, uh, even with women not being able to go to school, is the U.S. leaving. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like it, it's more stable now. Not that there's no fighting, but yeah. Um, and I'm not going to say that I'm thrilled about the Taliban taking over Afghanistan. No. But there's security. Yeah. Well, it just amazes me that the U.S. thought that 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 wouldn't happen. Yeah. Like that they they really believe their own height that they mm -hmm. had been training and, and building up this military that could hold it at least for a period of the time. Yeah. And that was that was never going to be the case. Like mm -hmm. the the Taliban was always playing the long game. Yeah. Like they knew eventually the Americans were going to leave, and yeah. so did everybody else in the country. Like it, it was no question once the Americans left that the Taliban was walking right back in. Yeah, the same thing was true in North Vietnam. Uh, yeah. for the North Vietnamese, I mean. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, like we can outlast. 
Yeah, right. These foreigners. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you know, um, well, and like I think because we advocate a particular uh, form of of government um, as such. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which is none, uh, but, <laughs> right? <laughs> really, but uh, you know, we you know we adv- okay. So we advocate a particular political philosophy yeah. uh, on this, and I, I think what may be lost sometimes to our listeners and even to ourselves is that the what we really advocate is that people need to find their own path. Yeah, um, and you can't impose it upon them. Exactly, and it, it's something that you you know that you said before, which is. Uh, you know, I don't care about your politics because your politics is my politics as long as you don't make me do your politics. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, you can do whatever you want in my society. Yeah. Like if you want, if you want communism in your little commune. Yeah. Hey, go you for it. You can do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you want to impose your communism on me, then we have a problem. Exactly. But as long, you know, people just need to find their own path. You can't impose Western style um you know, liberal democracy on everybody. Yeah. Well, they may get there. That, that, they may not. Yeah. On well, people that don't understand or want it, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, that's, that's never been what they've known. And to just go in and force it upon them is never going to work. Yeah. Like it's, it, it, do, that is one that has to be done organically. Yeah. Um, which like ours was, but I would say ours has failed. I mean, I'm not saying that ours is, great like it started great but look yeah. at where we're at now like <laughs> um I, I think that what we've proven is that it is uh very difficult to stave off authoritarianism yeah yeah it um will. that it, it creeps in yeah exactly and uh and maybe it can be stopped i i think that it can be stopped as long as um as long as people pay attention and understand uh, the importance of their you have to have an engaged their public. liberty yeah yeah I mean you do I, I think a lot of where we're at now is due to a public that's just not engaged or the values um, security over liberty yeah well that's the last 20 years yeah the last 20 years 20 22 23 years yeah that's really but since 9/11 mm-hmm. that's that's been that's been the cell that the government has used. Is, is security over freedom. Yeah. You know, and it's worked. I mean, it's it's worked for them, you mm-hmm. know, to get the power. Yeah. And I understand the, that freedom or, or, or fear is something of a prison too. But um, but sometimes you got to recognize what the source of that fear is. Yeah. Like, I would I would argue that it's not, it's not international terrorism. It's <laughs> your own government and media. Yeah, yeah. That's really the source of the fear. Absolutely. Um, not that you're afraid of them, but that they're creating the fear in you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That doesn't need to be there. That's that's unwarranted. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I got nothing else. Yeah. No, I'm good. All right. <laughs> well, let's let's abruptly <laughs> end there. <laughs> All right. That was a that was a fine final quote though. I think. Absolutely. Um, and uh, so. Uh, we are still, uh, somehow on YouTube, um, yeah. iTunes and Podbean. Uh, you can subscribe in all those places. Uh, you can like, like us on Facebook and, um, yeah, like, and share the, the posts and the memes and the podcasts and tell all your friends about us. And, uh, yeah, we'll keep, uh, we'll keep spreading this message as far and wide as we can, but we need your help with that. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, help us help us spread this around, and oh, there's nothing next week. We're probably Friday though again. Probably Friday next week. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, sorry the day keeps shifting, everybody, but at least it's shifting like tighter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're doing a little better. <laughs> we're we're doing better than in past years. I remember yeah. so when we got the uh, Atticus Finch Award um, from the Libertarian Party of Alabama last year. Mm-hmm. Um, and they said uh, in the introduction for us, they said uh, they did 39 podcasts in the last year. And I thought, there's 52 weeks in a year. <laughs> yeah, we missed a lot of weeks. <laughs> that, mean, that means that we missed literally a quarter of the podcast <laughs> that we should have done. Oh, uh, I kind of felt bad about that. Uh, oh, well. We're, we're 
on the, the right track, though. Yeah. yeah, we're doing the best we can. Absolutely. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we plan to be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.